Hello, welcome to Beginning Engineers. Today I am going to be talking about gauge R and R. How good are these gauges? What is it, and why should we use it? ANOVA Gauge Repeatability and Reproducibility, that's the R and R, is a measurement systems analysis, MSA technique, that uses an analysis of variance, that's the ANOVA, random effects model to assess a measurement system. The evaluation of a measurement system is not just limited to a gauge, but to all types of measuring instruments, test methods, and other measurement systems. Anything you're doing to measure your product is part of your measurement system. Gauge r and measures the amount of variability in measurements caused by the measurement system itself. This variability is then compared to the total variability observed to determine the viability of the measurement system. Gauge r and is involved in PPAP, Six Sigma, and other industry standards and best practices. Gauge r and is critical when new tools are used, new parts are made, new operators are hired, or a significant process change occurs. You have to know that your measuring system is viable. Basically, without gauge r and it is much harder to trust the measurement results produced, and measurements are key to meeting quality requirements. There are three main types of calculation methods to determine the gauge r and of your measurement system. The average and range method, ANOVA, and EMP, which stands for Evaluating the Measurement Process. Something important to note right away is that gauge r and tests for precision, not accuracy. So let's go over the difference between those two terms. Accuracy is how close a measurement is to the true value, whereas precision is how close the measurements of the same dimension or aspect are to each other, also called variation. Variation is often broken into repeatability and reproducibility. That's the R and R in gauge R and R. So to really understand the difference of accuracy and precision, let's look at the four images on the right side of this slide. Image A is accurate and precise. See how all those dots are in the center of the crosshair? They're all near each other, which is precise, similar locations, and they're all accurate. We were aiming for the crosshair. Image B is precise, but not accurate. So see how all the dots are still clustered together? That's precision, but they're not at the center of the crosshair. They're not as accurate as A. If your measuring system told you that a cat weighed 5,000 kilograms, and you measure that cat many times, with the weight only varying by 10 grams, your measurements would be very precise. They keep giving you the same results. But they're not accurate because a cat does not weigh anywhere close to 5,000 kilograms. Image C is accurate, but does not have as high a precision as image A. So see how in the C circle, all the dots are centered around the crosshair. If you average them, you probably would be right on the crosshair. But they're not as clustered together as they are in A. So the variation in the measurements, the variations in the location, vary. So it's not as precise, even though the accuracy is probably pretty good. And image D is neither accurate nor precise. The dots within circle D are not close to each other, so they're not very precise and they are not centered around the crosshair, so they are not accurate either. So if gauge r and r allows us to determine our variation in the measurement system, what causes this variation in the first place? It can be a few things. The measuring instruments themselves, and any mounting blocks, supports, fixtures, load cells, etc. The ability and skill of your operator, to follow the instructions and use the equipment to take measurements, the test methods themselves, how the devices are set up and used, how data is recorded. It could be the specification. So measurements are reported against a specification or a reference value. The engineering tolerance does not affect the measurement, but it is an important factor in evaluating the viability of the measurement system. If you're manufacturing just fine within tolerance, but you get a new specification that is much tighter, now the variation in your measurement system could be a bigger factor. The parts themselves can cause variation. Based on your setup, some items are easier to measure than others. Steel versus rubber, 
solids versus liquid, etc. Again, the two important aspects of gauge R&R are repeatability and reproducibility. Repeatability is the variation in measurements taken by the same person on the same instrument on the same product under the same conditions. Everything repeats. How much variation is in that? Reproducibility is the variation created when different operators, instruments, or labs measure the same products. So how easily can these results be reproduced? If either repeatability or reproducibility leads to a high variation in measurements, then it's likely that something about your measurement system is wrong. Then we have the percentage of tolerance ratio, PT ratio. Gauge R&R helps you to determine the precision of your system, which can then be divided by the tolerance on your parts to determine how much of your tolerance is being taken by your measurement system. If your setup has a typical variation of 3 millimeters, and it's recommended to use 3 or 6 standard deviations as how you define this variation, so if you have that variation of 3 millimeters when measuring a dimension on a part, and that dimension's tolerance is plus or minus 5 millimeters, then your manufacturing generally has to be within 2 millimeters of the nominal, or the measurement you think is within tolerance could actually be out of tolerance. So think of it like this. You have specs on a design you need to meet. If your measurement system causes tons of variation, then how can you trust your measurement? How can you know you're within tolerance? For the PT ratio, anything below 0 0.10 is considered acceptable. So the variance in your measurement system eats up 10% of your total tolerance. That or less is considered acceptable. Let's go over an example of how to actually do gauge r and And for this example, we're going to use the average and range method because it is the easiest to explain and it involves a little less statistics than the other methods, and I don't want this video to be half an hour long. It is important to note that the average and range method is considered inferior to the other methods by some. However, it is still an acceptable method per AIAG, and for instructional purposes, it will help get the point across, and we'll still touch on the other two a little bit. The general steps to perform gauge r and the average and range method, are below. Step 1. Calibrate your gauge or gauges and have sample parts prepared. Step 2. Ensure that you have your operators and parts correctly labeled and identified both in the physical world and in your documents, where you will be recording the actual measurements. Step 3. Have each operator measure the same dimension on multiple parts multiple times and tell you or the dimension recorder what the results are so they can be written down. Step four, apply the r, &R formulas to your results to understand your variance due to your measurement system. So let's actually do an example together. Let's pretend the following table was our results from two parts and two operators. So we have operator one, O1, and operator two, O2. Part one, P1, and part two, P2 and each part had its measurement taken four times. Let's say the actual true dimension is 0 0.50. This is not something you could ever really know because you only know through measurements. But for this example, just so you get a good idea of what this is capturing, we'll say the true dimension is 0.5. First, we need to find the mean and range for each operator part combination. So operator one, part one, the range is 0.04, and the mean is 0.5125. Operator one part two, the range is 0 0.04 again, and the mean is 0.4875. And do the same for operator two with both parts. Then you have to find the mean of the means and range for each operator. So operator one mean range, you add the range for both parts together and divide by two to get the mean of the range, 0 0.04. Operator 1's mean mean is 0 0.50. You do the same for operator 2. Then you find the total mean range and difference in averages, x diff. So the total range mean, 0 0.04 plus 0 0.035, divided by 2, 
is 0 0.0375. So that's the mean range of each operator, the mean of that. The difference, the range, between the averages is one average for one operator subtracted from the average of the other operator. So 0 0.50 minus 0.49875, which equals 0 0.00125. So we have the range between our two averages, and then we have the average of our two average ranges. It's a bit flip-flopped, I know, but we need them for the equations. Once you have these values, you then need to use something called a D2 table. First, we're going to calculate repeatability, and to do that, we need a value called K1 and D2. And the D2 table is used so we can find the K1 value for the equation. To find your D2 value in the table, you need to know two things. The subgroup size, which is n, that's the number of times the measurement was taken. So in our case, each part was measured four times. And then you also need to know K, the number of subgroups. In this case, the number of combinations of parts and operator, which is four in our case. Two parts times two operators, four total combinations, so k equals four. Then in the table, you find the cell that corresponds to your subgroup size of n, which is four, and your k, the number of subgroups, which is also four. And c in the table on the bottom of the screen, four and four, that cell is 2.105. That is our D2 value. And then using that D2 value, we calculate K1 by taking 1 and dividing it by that 2.105, which gets us 0.47506. Repeatability is then calculated using the following formula. EV equals R bar times K1. R bar is the total range mean that we calculated earlier between both operators. 0 0.0375. K1 we just got 0 0.47506. EV then equals those two values multiplied by each other. 0 0.01782. That's our repeatability. Repeatability is also known as equipment variance, which is where the EV comes from. Reproducibility is calculated using the following formula. AV equals the square root of x diff times k2 squared minus ev squared divided by n times r, and it's the square root of everything. Again, x diff being the difference, the range, and means, 0 0.00125, n, the number of parts of the study, 2, r, the number of measurements per part, 4, and k2, it must be found using a formula in d2 table. So it's like k1, but slightly different. The difference with our D2 table this time, we're still using the same table, but instead of using the number of measurements for the subgroup size, we are using the number of parts, so two. So two and four on your table, not four and four. And that gets you a different value. That gets you 1.206 for your D2 value. Plug that into your equation of one divided by D2, and we get 0.8292 as our k2 value. Then plug that in along with your x diff, your ev value, which is repeatability, and your n and your r, and we get an av of negative 0.0000389, the square root of that. But because it's a negative number, our av is zero. Our reproducibility is zero. To then get the gauge r and r value, it's the square root of repeatability squared, EV squared, plus our reproducibility squared, AV squared. So it's the square root of 0 0.01782 squared plus 0 squared, which gets us 0 0.01782, because we squared it and took the square root. Or you can think of that as 1.782%. Sometimes you'll see that value, the 0 0.01782, divided by the total variance, the TV, to obtain a gauge R and R percent in some formulas, PV being part variation in the formula below. Based on the following advice from SPC for Excel, if your gauge R and R percent is under 10%, your measurement system is generally considered to be adequate. Between 10 and 
the measurement system may be acceptable for some applications, but not others. If it's over 30%, the measurement system is considered to be unacceptable. There are other ways to calculate your gauge R&R. ANOVA, that adds the operator times part interaction and includes a degree of freedom element. ANOVA mainly focuses on the degrees of variation themselves. So as you can see in the image on the top right, you have a source column, part, operator, repeatability, you have DF for degrees of freedom, and then you have several other fields. So ANOVA focuses on those degrees of variation and how much they contribute to the total variation. EMP, which stands for Evaluating the Measurement Process, also focuses on the different sources of variation like ANOVA, but it does not include the operator part interaction, and it even focuses on subgroups of data like the average and range method. And something to note with ANOVA and EMP is that there are different equations as well, but they are all trying to get to the same underlying idea, how much your measurement system variation affects your measurements. And finally, what are some good charts, some good visualization tools that can help with the gauge R&R process? You have an R chart. This chart will monitor the variation in the process, repeatability, and reproducibility by showing the range between different operator part measurements. The control limits on this chart are key. You never want to go out of control. You have the X bar chart, which is paired with the R chart and shows part variation. Control limits and X bar chart represent the measurement system variation, so you actually want your measured part variation to be outside the control limits, which signifies you can differentiate your part variation from measurement system variation. Think about it this way. If your measurement system variation was very wide and your part variation was within that, you wouldn't know if that was actually the part variation causing different measurements or your measurement system being so out of control. Other helpful charts include variation by part sample, overall average by operator, operator sample interaction. But for all of those, similar to the charts above, these charts seek to show the operator part process variation and whether it is in control or not. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you now understand what gauge RNR is, how it's critical to a measurement system, and how you can perform a gauge RNR study. If you like this video, feel free to like the video or subscribe. And if you want to leave a comment suggesting a new video I could make, feel free. I might actually make a video on the subject, which I've done a few times. Have a great day.